we don't know. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a concept in, you know, the Kabbalist mysticism in the Zohar and it's the idea of the, the Sitra Akra and the Sitra Akra is, is somewhat translated as the upside down, but more literally it means to, instead of being face to face with the divine, which means in the light, in the truth, in the way, I guess, if you wanted to say it from Jesus's terms, which I don't know if the, my Jewish ancestors would appreciate me quoting Jesus. And he was Jewish too. This term, he was, <laughs> he was indeed. Uh, <clears throat> but ultimately like face to face with the divine, which is looking at the light. And that means seeing that all is of all is of God or nothing is, as Paul Selig says, like it's all part of the divine emanation. And so to actually have perspective, you have to see everything from every perspective, or at least even if you can't articulate it, feel that thing. That's face to face. That's the opposite of Sitra Akra. And the moment you move into your separate self, which is to shut off at least the side of your face from the divine, that's creating distortion. So the prism, instead of being a clear prism face to face with God, the prism has distortion. And the farther you turn away from the divine, the face of the divine, the deeper into Sitra Akra you go, the deeper you go into the upside down, because the more distortion is created until you've literally turned your back on the divine, which means that you believe as your separate self that you are the divine, denying the, 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 the unity, the interbeing, the state of interbeing that you are with the rest of the world. And then so you're in the deepest distortion because the light is not, it's obviously still penetrates through, but it's all distorted. And I think this is, you know, this is the place we're in. We're recognizing that we've all turned our face from the divine in a huge way. And frankly, for good reasons, because God has been one of the, quote, God, and I say that with quotes, God, as told by the church, has been one of the most oppressive forces <laughs> in human history, right? Which obviously isn't the God that we know in our hearts that is our hearts, exactly, you know, but that force itself has oh, yeah. actually twisted us and turned us oh. away from actually even the understanding of God. And then now we're living in this reality where, yeah, we're in the Sitra Akra. And now it's time to turn our face back towards the truth, the light and the divine. And that's kind of what we're all trying to do is bend our eyes back to, back to the truth. It's interesting. If you go back thousands of years, I can imagine a shepherd on a hillside, probably somewhere in the Middle East, maybe even, you know, either in the Fertile Crescent or maybe over, you know, somewhere on the Mediterranean where Israel would be today or Palestine, whatever you want to basically refer to it as, mm -hmm. that area. And one man saying, okay, my grass is greener, but, you know, when you're there, if you, have you been to Jerusalem? Mm -mm. I got to take you. To take it. I'm going mm -hmm. in February again. But when you're there, it's astounding. If you stand on the Mount of Olives and you look at the Temple Mount, which is called Mount Moriah, across the Valley of Kidron, the Mount of Olives is right beneath you. You're looking down. You can see the east side of, of the, the Temple Mount, which is where King Solomon's Temple was, right? And then there's another valley on the other side. You really are astounded by the fact that if you just look behind you, you're at the top of the mountain on this mm -hmm. side. It's all desert. Mm -hmm. It's all desert. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's nothing there. It's nothing all the way Dead Sea. It's nothing. Then as soon as you're on this one side of this mountain, all of a sudden the climate's completely different. It's like this oasis in the middle of the desert. Now, you can see why people fought over this land because it was about survival, right? It's 100% about survival. So let's say you're a shepherd and you have this flock and you're like, well, this year, you know, the sun's been kind of harsh on my side of the hill. My neighbor over there, you know, he worships a different God. And my God came to me in a dream last night. His, green, his grass is really green. And my God came to me and said, you know what? I need to kill him and consecrate his land to my God. And that's a righteous act. We're talking about <laughs> since the beginning of time. The most heinous acts that we can even contemplate in society have been started with that line of thinking. Yeah. And the conflation of true God with the ego's self-serving bias and the ego's inflationary tendency to be, I am the only God. That's right. So I'm the defender of the oppressed. I'm the defender of the weak. And I'm the defender of my God. And mm -hmm. this concept, I think, is what has been so challenging for humanity. Right. And I think it's a, it's a construct that's very much tied to dualistic thinking.
right? Yeah. And, and I think where we're now transitioning towards is to be able to see more perspectives, more viewpoints. And I think the, the doorway for me personally was drawing geometry. Yeah, I want to get. I want to talk about that. That's I think very important, and also all of the different decoding you've done of all of the people who've been leaving us clues along the way. But just to stick with this point and double click on it one more time. I mean, when Jesus was saying "Love thy neighbor as thyself," what he was pointing to was the true was the true nature of the yeah. divine, which is that you or me living a different life. So killing you is killing me, and so. Ultimately, we have to figure this out and say, you got some grass over there. And they got to look at you and say, like, I got some grass over here. I am you. You are me. Exactly. Let's work on this together. Exactly. Let's fucking figure it out. And, mm -hmm. and in that way, both could be part of the same thing. But in this identity, the self-identification of separateness, separate God, separate self, separate this, then the natural inclination is war, conflict rather than cooperation. Yeah, we, we just lose sight of the fact that I tend to think of the universe less as a you universe and more as a you inverse. So if you start to think that because I can't separate myself from my own conditioning biases, I can't separate the lens of my perception from all of the history of my nurture and nature experiences, right? And my genetic code and all the things that come along with that. If I can start to think differently about, can I put myself in another person's shoes? And if they go back then to the same, you, you've been quoting Jesus, so I'll go ahead and quote too. Uh, by the day, by the way, today is a very special day because today is the day, the national day of the rose, right? Mm. The national day of the rose, which is representative of early Christianity also amongst many other things. And um, something that's really important about this is this concept of sacrifice as well. And Mary Magdalene's symbol was also the red rose, but so was the Virgin Mary's symbol. There, you've got it right on your arm. So, the, and I've been thinking about this all morning, about this concept of, of the rose, because I've always had this symbol in my mind, and I'm a Taurus, and I, the bull loves the rose. And the reason why it's the rose that he loves is because the bull's eye, which is the brightest star in Taurus constellation, is Aldebaran. Aldebaran is the brightest star, and it's the right eye of the bull. And it's a red star, and it's the rose. Hmm. So there's always symbolisms in cartoons. You see where the bull is always surrounded by roses and such. You go to a bullfight in Spain and they always got the red rose around there. It's all this part of the same symbology. Well, what we all do not recognize is that the things that we're judging in other people are the things we don't like about ourselves and that this universe is really a you inverse of projection of your subconscious mind and the sum total of all your conditioning biases. So instead of judging these things, we should learn to love and accept it, which is exactly what Jesus taught. He taught two great commandments. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, might, mind, and strength. The second is to love thy neighbor as thyself. Might have been one commandment. Might have been one. <laughs> Might <laughs> have been the, one. And that's the secret. It was, he's saying the same thing twice. And there's a provided however that. It's like a contract that's got a provided yeah. however that, right? The provided however that is judge not lest ye be judged with the same judgment that you cast. And the ye in this context, when you actually read it in the original text, can easily be translated just as you said. It might be the same thing between neighbor as thyself and yourself, right? God as well, love mm -hmm. God. Actually could also mean lest you judge yourself mm. with the same judgment. That you cast on others because you you are because you are i <laughs> am that i am you know one of the great things is funny when donald trump became president i'm not a republican i'm not democrat i'm independent i'm absolutely like middle of the road on same this same. one so but i had a hard time when donald became president i'll be honest i had a hard time with it because i'm like Geez, you know, why can't he just like communicate a little differently? Yeah, just f come on, man. Come on, man. <laughs> I know it's like, 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 like I was like, and, and it's on, yeah, again. And I've me. met him, I've met the guy yeah. just, you know, 20 years ago or something, and he wasn't a bad guy. He was actually like a very personable person. And everybody that's met the person says this about him. But he, but I also knew Mitt Romney very well, right? Because at one point in my career, the Republican Party asked me to run for U.S. Senate. And I said, well, I'm an independent. And they're like, yeah, but we know Republicans can't win in California. And it's funny because I didn't run. And the person, I decided not to do it after I had 
worked on a few campaigns just to see what it would be like. I really, I was on Meg Whitman's campaign. I got involved with hers and, and I got involved with, uh, with Mitt's and, and I just watched the process. And I was like, uh, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. Like run, right? Yeah, no, sure. thanks. So I didn't run and no one ran against her. And guess who ended up running in that election? Kamala Harris. She won in California. There was no opposing candidate. So she literally just got in without any issues. But I, I remember going to the ballot box going, oh, my gosh, no one ran against so her. So the vice president might be your fault. Might be. <laughs> it might actually be. Jeez. <laughs> right. What the hell? Or, you know, your Who knows? Your, your, she probably would have beat me anyway. If, yeah, I don't know. know. But, but I just didn't want anything to do with it because I realized it was just another thing that was tied to judgment. And I was – it's such kind a toxic, moving it's such out a toxic of such a toxic environment. environment, right? And even more toxic now. Oof. I mean, like what we saw in the in the Trump Biden election was the worst of humanity in many ways. Like oh. it was it was the worst it was the worst form of communication I've ever seen. Like it, like it, honestly, it was, it was horrible. It was totally horrible. So as I was kind of looking at that, I watched Donald get elected. Every day I'd like turn on the TV and I'd be, and my wife would go, why are you so upset about this? I go, but he just needs to change the way he says this. He has it. I mean, what the hell? You know, some of his right. principles aren't horrible, right? right? They're not horrible, but the way he goes about it is just like driving me nuts. And then finally I realized, why is it that this is triggering me so much? Because I am that. Mm -hmm. I had to come to the realization that some of the things that I couldn't stand in him are things I was in denial about related to my own personality. Right. And I had to learn how to integrate that so that by the end of his presidency, I was like, okay, I accept that this is just the way he does things. And I, I was no longer triggered by it. And I think all of us, you know, we tend to run away from the things that trigger us in other people. That's why it's wonderful to have opposition things. That's why it's wonderful to have the duality experience because through that experience, we learn more about ourselves and learn to transmute our negative feelings toward it to feelings of acceptance and love. Yeah. When I, I discovered a prime number pattern in 2018 and I got two invitations. One was to go to the Vatican to give a presentation to a bunch of like cardinals and stuff on prime number pattern, which turned out to be the shape of a photon. And literally on a mod 24, it looks like the exact shape of a photon of light. And it also looks like a cross. It looks just like a cross, a Templar cross, in fact. So the Catholic church asked me to come out and present there. So I flew out to the Vatican, I presented there. And then I got another invitation from the Dalai Lama to come and teach the Dalai Lama this prime number pattern, right? So I'm thinking now, wait a minute, I've stepped into a different world right? Mm -hmm. This is not the world I was in where I was, you know, career oriented person and this, that, and the other in the pharmaceutical industry and medical aesthetics or in ophthalmology and the eye business. And now I'm finding myself in Dharamsala sitting right next to Dalai Lama, teaching him in his house, prime number pattern. And he looks at me and he says, I think one day you will be able to prove higher consciousness mathematically. And I was like, whoa, what, a, what an epic moment. And yeah. there has been, you know, he has tons of people, scientists and everything to come and visit him. And I brought seven people with me, other physicists, mathematicians, and a stem cell scientist. And he asked the question, he said, do you believe that glass of water is conscious? And, I, and we said, yeah, we do, because it has feedback, it has memory. We know this from DNA, you know. And he was like, Okay, and it was, and he was so humble, and he was such like an open-minded person on everything because the guy has studied physics. He wrote a book on physics mm. called "The Universe in a Single Atom," hmm. as a fractal. It's another "as above, so below" kind of concept. And I remember sitting there with him, and he, he actually even told me, and this might kind of be surprising to you, may not. He said, "You know, in my house in Tibet." I have the records of when Asa visited Tibet 2,000 years ago. Who's Asa? Jesus. Mm. Yeshua. Yeshua. So the name they wrote it as in their language was Asa, who was from Palestine. And he, and he actually told me of the records that they have where Jesus came. And not only did he come to Tibet, and he spent 
something like 12 years there. So this is that time period between the time he was 12 years old until he was 30 when his ministry began, right? There are records all over India where he visited Jainism, learned Zoroastrianism, learned Tibetan Buddhism, right? And was very much trained in all of those things as, as a monk, according to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. They have the records of that entire hmm. story. I was fascinated by that because when you go back to ancient Israel and you study what was the Old Testament about, the Decalogue, right? The Decalogue is the Ten Commandments. So you're, you know, you know, you probably know the Baruch, Atah, Adonai, Elohim, 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 you know, all of the Hebrew prayers, etc. I speak Hebrew as one of the languages I speak, although I'm not Jewish. Mm. But I find it to be a very fascinating language. No doubt. Numerically oriented and based. And when you actually go back and look at the time period of when Jesus was born. The language they spoke then was not Hebrew. It was similar. It's Aramaic, right? That was a period where the Pharisees and Sadducees had so much control and power over the land, right? It was ostensibly a colony that was controlled locally by theological sort of leanings. You know, they had King Herod also during that time, who was you know, pretty much kind of a tyrant, right? I mean, obviously anyone that goes around and like in the Bible story and has all the young children killed because they might be someone who might replace him type of thing, not exactly a good guy, probably. Yeah, you could you could put him in the tyrant category. You could put him in the put tyrant in the category. category. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and so what happened during there at that time, you had from Moses on the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, here are the things that you can and you can't do. Right? You shouldn't commit adultery. You should not murder someone. You should not 